This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your guest host, Ann Moyer, a molecular genetic pathologist at Mayo Clinic. Today, we're rounding with the Bowtie Bandit of Blood himself, Dr. Justin Kreuter, a Mayo Clinic transfusion medicine pathologist at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Kreuter is also the chair of Mayo Clinic School of Medicine Social Med- Media Committee, that's a bit of a mouthful, and a faculty lecturer for Harvard Macy Institute on Professional Use of Social Media, which is why today we're sitting down to talk about the challenges and opportunities of being a professional on social media. Thanks for joining us today as a guest, Dr. Kreuter. Hey, thanks so much, Dr. Moyer. It's nice to have the tables turned on me today. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really excited about this topic. So I think we can go ahead and just jump right into it. There's something I've been really curious about. What are a few of the potential risks and benefits of using social media as a professional? Why should I be doing this and thinking about it? I'm definitely on the on the pro side of it all. But I think uh, to be fair, I think some of the kind of risks that a lot of people really are concerned with, rightfully so, are, you know, the the risk of any kind of unprofessional behavior is definitely out there on on full display. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of concern about what could this mean for my, you know, future employment, uh, professional activities. And then also, as um, we all have busy plates, uh, there's also this worry and concern about this time suck. I mean, (laughs) yeah, I've got two young daughters and we're really, you know, uh, cognizant of how much time they're spending on uh, various computers and pads and stuff. Um, And so I think those are some of the big risks that I think why so many people are kind of leery about diving into social media. But I think for me, uh, the benefits really outweigh the risks. So, you know, the ability to, to network with your group. And for some of us, we might belong to, you know, smaller communities like myself as a transfusion medicine uh, physician where you know at any one particular hospital there may not be as many of us it's a it's a way for us to really uh, come together and um, and network there's also the ability to uh, you know continue to have that lifelong uh, aspirational goal of lifelong learning and so you know that happens in between the conferences, but even during conferences, it's almost like a, a second layer of activity that's going on with a lot of the medical conferences that are going on uh, these days. And then it really uh, provides through that kind of networking and, and education, there's just this professional community that that's where uh, awareness for uh, who we are and and what we're developing in. You know, you might have collaborators for research uh, reach out to you based on your activity on social media. So I think those are a couple of the kind of risks and and benefits. Um, I think the benefits are, are awesome. And I think that the risks can be mitigated. Those do sound like some really good benefits. So one question that comes up, since you mentioned quite a few risks there, and it sounds a little concerning, well, people can just adjust their privacy settings on social media. So why is it really important for healthcare professionals and students to behave professionally on social media? Yeah, I I think uh, I have a colleague. um, I have a colleague that uh, teaches, that also teaches professionalism and social media. And he makes a point of actually going and, and researching his students ahead of time online and usually prevents uh, or presents some rather shocking uh, stuff about what he finds because you know so many people have this uh, belief in kind of privacy uh, you know as long as my privacy settings are kind of locked down and I you know the way networks work or you know even if it's just somebody that's in your private network were to kind of screenshot something and share it out um you know that's uh, you know it, privacy is, is probably i think we should just kind of think of it as a fairy tale on social media and that's why i very much uh believe in kind of share, showing up as 
myself on social media. So, uh, you know, I'm not uh, the the mystical like like my handle is not the bow tie bandit of blood, where it's a little bit of who who is this person? Uh, but you know, my handle on social media is Kreuter MD, my last name, and then my uh, degree. Uh, so it's very clear who I am, which also kind of helps remind me that, you know, it, I'm not an anonymous uh, person, um, you know, and there's plenty of examples out there too, where people have thought that they were anonymous. So I, I'm a big believer in, uh, we just really need to understand that we always need to behave professionally on social media. And to take that one step further with my work with the medical students, sometimes there's this thought of, well, I'll have one channel where it's, it's private and locked down in one channel where I'm, you know, showing up professionally. And, uh, you know, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that's, it that probably just adds uh, work to yourself. And at the end of the day, the stuff that you're posting privately, you know, ultimately could be noble. And so you just want to make sure that we don't uh, commit these, um, you know, unprofessional acts that will continue to be with us. That's really important information to know. So basically, it sounds like you're saying it's hard to be anonymous. It's hard to be truly private. So we need to be a little careful about what we put out there because it probably be connected to us in some way. But kind of along those lines, some might say that there's several shades of gray when it comes to professionalism. So what do we really need to understand about well, what exactly is professionalism? Are there things I can get away with? Or what do I need to really be careful about? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I, I certainly get that as a as a program director uh, teaching. We are always you know grading people and assessing professionalism, and sometimes that does get into this very uh, murky world. And that's why I think the litmus test that I usually share out is you know for people that are here here at Mayo Clinic, I say you know pretend you're in in the elevator with Dr. Faruja, our current uh, CEO, right? Uh, so same thing, I guess you sort of whatever institution you're at. Imagine you're at your institution in the elevator with your boss's boss, for example. And, you know, everything you see and post, you would feel comfortable with that person there in the, in the elevator overhearing your conversation, seeing what photos you're bringing up on your phone. Uh, I think that's kind of a litmus test. I think that's a nice one for those of us in medicine, right? Because that's what we're sort of used to now is I think beginners that are just learning sometimes commit that, you know, initial error. They'll be rounding and they'll be in the elevator and not appreciating that there are people not from the medical team in the elevator. And so we kind of get used to this model of, you know, understanding that, you know, we're not supposed to be talking about patients when we're in the elevator. And uh, I think if we do that, um, that's that's a wonderful way, because if I'm in that elevator and I'm talking about uh, transfusion medicine to a colleague or, uh, you know, talking to a patient, explaining, you know, um, kind of what transfusion medicine does, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Frugia would probably give me a nice uh, thumbs up pat on the back. Um, and uh, likewise, if I'm, I'm, if I'm posting, you know, interesting content with questions that's, you know, meant to help my learners uh, become better physicians, uh, same sort of thing. So um, that's the litmus test. I think that kind of clears up uh, in most cases um, what's appropriate or not. And then I guess maybe the old adage of, you know, if, if when in doubt, maybe hold back. <laughs> I think those are fantastic tips. Really, the elevator analogy, I think, resonates quite well because that's something we all learn pretty early on in our medical training. So the social media, it really wasn't a thing. I probably shouldn't even admit this, but when I was a trainee, it, it really wasn't around. So I understand that you have some uh, things that you've helped students and faculty navigate social media. Can you share a few of those significant challenges with us? Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, these are the things that, uh, so my experience has been uh, kind of centered around two topics. One is really getting into, uh, you know, like requests for medical judgment, uh, right? And uh, as we know from uh, being in healthcare, uh, you really need to have a, a patient physician relationship with somebody before, you know, giving advice and talking about um, the situation, the same, same thing here, you know, if somebody uh, reaches out about a specific uh, topic, I've got a patient in this situation, da, 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 um, you know, it's probably inappropriate for me to kind of share my medical judgment, because I don't 
know what the resources and local capabilities are, just in my example of transfusion medicine. And I think people can feel really uh, pulled about this, right? Um, but we just have to remember that, you know, it, the social media world is designed for networking. It's designed for communication. It's not designed to do a medical consult. Um, sometimes that gets a little blurry when people are kind of putting out, um, you know, continuing medical questions and, and working for education. But there's been some examples that I've seen come across that are uh, clearly uh, looking for medical advice. And that's not really the place uh, for that. Um, even when my colleagues uh, reach out to me with questions, as, as we all do, that's not saying that that can't take place, but they don't tweet me. <laughs> these questions, you know, they might uh, direct message me and ask if they can call me and stuff, right? But that's where more information can be relayed. And then ultimately, of course, their judgment uh, takes reign. So I think that request for medical judgment uh, gets a lot of people feeling uncomfortable. And it's kind of nice to say, you know, hey, uh, and most of us probably have on our profiles, uh, you know, my tweets are not medical advice. Um, and we just need to remember that. The other tricky issue, which is super tricky these days, is political <laughs> challenges. Um, you know, uh, and uh, it's really challenging to walk those ropes. And so I, I would say that, uh, you know, at, for people certainly that are just sort of novice getting into this uh, world of, of social media, willing to give it a try, uh, definitely I would not engage with any sort of political. Um, uh, content. And for people that are more experienced and quite savvy, uh, you know, professional social media, uh, just like professional um, uh, engagement here at work is, you know, uh, we can talk to patients about, uh, you know, political issues that are you know, the medicine of it, like, you know, uh, should I get my child vaccinated, uh, for example, right? There's American College of Pediatri Pediatricians that have their recommendations. I mean, I can be talking about that kind of information, but I, I'm not going to sit down with my uh, patients and talk to them about, you know, who they should be voting for, or which uh, political agenda they need to be supporting. And so likewise here is we should not be uh, showing up on social media and advocating for uh, specific candidates or platforms. We really need to stay issue uh, focused uh, because that's where we are. And I really hope that as a community, we do develop better, um, cultivate better expertise and how can we talk about these and stay focused on the issue because I think that's one of the main things we're seeing is that uh, having the medical professionals voice in the room is important. Uh, but we just need to know that when we're doing that, we're not engaging as a private citizen, we're engaging as a healthcare professional. And so staying focused on the issue is, is the other challenge that I think um, is definitely out there. And it's definitely, we should reserve that for people that are uh, got some uh, expertise on social media. Yeah, those are some fantastic suggestions. I think those are tricky topics and definitely good ones to be aware of for anyone that's new to this, especially. So in terms of those of us that are a little new to this, to be totally honest, I usually share cat pictures and I look to see what my friends and family around the world are doing. But someone recently said, you know, you need a professional Twitter account. So I've got one. It's set up. What do I do with it? Any tips for those of us that are just getting started that don't want to just keep sharing cat photos and maybe you want to take it up to the next level and do something more professional with it? Right on. So I I, um, I applaud you and, and should celebrate you for getting on the profile. I think that's the first thing, right? You know, it's just like uh, swimming lessons. You know, we want to, we need to do swimming lessons at the pool. So uh, getting registered and setting up your account is, is really important. I think it's nice that you've set up a professional account for yourself. I think that's also uh, nice to do. Uh, I think the next thing then is you really want to start watching uh, people and understanding how does the 
exchange and how do the conversations go so you you know just like you don't go to the pool and take a dive off uh in the deep end right it, you know you're gonna first get in and kind of see how are people swimming around in this pool and a great way for people to do that is when you get onto twitter is just search your relevant uh social um uh, professional society so for me it's the american association of blood banks um you know so and there's all of our medical societies out there and most of them are probably on social media reach out and see once you look at their profile you can look to see uh who are they following and they're typically following you know the uh you know the the professionals in your society that are also engaged on that social media platform and and for healthcare for the most part the main social media platform is really twitter and so if you go into the american association of blood banks and on their profile look and see who are they following uh they will be following people that are uh engaging professionally and then go and take a look and see how are they uh talking what are they talking about how are they interacting with each other i think it's really nice to kind of understand the the kind of rules of the road there the other thing that i'd say right off the bat is uh so i'm glad you said cat photos because i think the other thing to talk about this mitigating uh, so the first one watching other professionals interact that's a great way to mitigate that risk of unprofessional behavior and then the second one is um, i think you should kind of be like a cat and, and not like a dog, <laughs> meaning that this is how we mitigate kind of that time suck of where you, people talk about these infinity pools where you're just sitting there scrolling on on feeds. And so uh, what I mean by that about be the cat, and not the dog is, you know, be in control of when you are engaging on social media. So uh, for most of us, what that means is you turn off uh, notifications on your phone. Uh, and so, for example, uh, if I am on uh, clinical service or I'm busy in meetings and stuff, you know, I don't have the vibrato going on my phone or getting dinged and, and getting my attention pulled to social media because that's not my job. Uh, so I need to be the one in, in control. Um, and uh, that that's a great way to make sure we don't get kind of caught in this and letting it take uh, too much of our time. So I, I love that of being like the cat that, you know, cats don't really uh, listen in the same way that dogs uh, when, you know, when one I got two dogs now and when they hear, you know, a uh, treat, they they uh, buckle up and do whatever we want them to do. <laughs> <laughs> we had a cat, not the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my cat does what he wants to do. So I think that's a good analogy for me and some great tips. So I think I've got some homework maybe for later today or tomorrow to start looking for some of those professional societies and who they're following. So I think we really talked about a lot of different things that are very important here, including earlier on, we talked about some of the benefits of social media and some of the risks as well. And I think it's been helpful to hear about some of the ways that we can mitigate those risks. But just in general, I hear a lot of mixed perspectives about where social media is headed. Is it going to really be something important in the future? Are we going to be left behind if we didn't jump on the bandwagon? So what's your view of professional use of social media? So probably unsurprisingly, I, I've got a, a wonderful rosy view. And what I think I need to explain is that um, social media is, I, I think in the long term, it, it's here to stay. It's just that next generation of how are we communicating with one another? Uh, and so right now, like I mentioned, the main uh, platform for uh, professional social media for healthcare professionals is Twitter. Uh, that's now in 2021. Uh, that may not be the case in <laughs> 2025. I don't know. Things may change. But I guess I would say that we should not look at it as a loss because what I see us doing is we're developing, we're cultivating a skill set you know, and we are cultivating a digital di identity uh, when we're interacting on these profiles. And so, you know, as we can see it in our colleagues, some of our colleagues are really easy on like creating quick videos and educational stuff and others of us are not so. And, and you can see how some people are really moving ahead and others of us are, are not so, um, you know, able to kind of do that. And so what I'd say is by investing in it, the platform and tools may change, but the skills that we cultivate, I think are going to continue to serve us 
you know, on the next platform, uh, whatever that might be. And, you know, I think it's healthy to kind of keep that idea that uh, we're really platform uh, or to be platform agnostic, just cultivate how do we talk to one another on uh, online? How do we, you know, create videos and things? These are all wonderful skills for, you know, interacting as, as a professional uh, and especially for those of us that are engaged in uh, teaching, because a lot of, um, you know, a lot of educational frontiers really open up, whether that's kind of spaced repetition and things like that, which is super cool. I think it's going to be really exciting to see what these platforms look like five or 10 years from now. It seems like we've got a lot to look forward to. They'll probably be evolving, but I agree. That sounds like a great skill set to be cultiv cultivating. Well, today we've been rounding with Dr. Kreuter about using social media professionally. Thank you for taking the time to discuss this topic with us. It's been really helpful to me, and I hope the same for all of our listeners. Hey, and thank you so much, Ed. Thanks. To all of, your, all of our listeners, thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions via email. Please direct any suggestions to mcleducation at mayo.edu. And if you have enjoyed Lab Medicine Rounds podcast, please follow or subscribe. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine into the clinical practice through insightful conversations.